In his first season as an NFL head coach, Mike McDonald has led the Seattle Seahawks to a 3-0 start on the year. The Seattle Seahawks are looking to become 4-0 for the first time since 2020. They are currently one of just five undefeated teams in the league. And Mike McDonald's defensive mind, along with their incredible defensive line as well as secondary, have led the Seahawks to allowing the fourth fewest points in the league with 14.3 points per game. They currently have the fourth best point differential in the league with a plus 30 point differential. And the Seahawks are the first team since the 1979 Steelers to start 3-0 and allow fewer than 150 passing yards in each of their first three games in a season. And with a win Monday night in Detroit, McDonald would become the first rookie head coach since Dan Quinn in 2015 to start 4-0. You're right in thinking that the opponents that they played so far this year in the Broncos, the Patriots, and then the Dolphins without Tua haven't been the top tier. But with the Hawks being 3-0 and and the rest of the NFC West being 1-2, and they are in a great spot. And we'll see how they fare in Detroit in their first true test of the season. So let's get into the Seahawks-Lions preview with Will Ortner. But before we do, this podcast is sponsored by our friends at Black Label Supplements. They have a great product line of supplementation from creatine, pre-workout, protein, amino acids, you name it, they got it. Go check them out at blacklabelsupplements.com. Grind, hustle, win, repeat. Use code COUCHGM for 15% off your order. And as always, if you or someone you know is thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing a property in the Pacific Northwest, make sure to reach out to myself, Connor Webb, the Couch GM. My contact information will be in the description of this video. I'm a full-time mortgage broker during the day when I'm not making sports videos about my Pacific Northwest teams. Reach out if you'd like to get in touch. And with that, let's get into the podcast. Your Seattle Seahawks are 3-0 and after three weeks. They are the only undefeated team in the NFC West. Actually, the rest of the NFC West currently is 1-2 and after three weeks. They are in a great spot heading into a, a tough match, matchup in Detroit. Primetime football Monday night this coming Monday against the Lions. Will, what are your thoughts on the, on the Seahawks season up to this point? Well, uh, first off, I'd like to say it's just a shame that all the other teams are one and two. Like, it's unfortunate. You hate to see it. You don't want to see it. It's it's a terrible tragedy. Um, I hate that the 49ers are already banged up and beat up. I don't like that. That's not cool. You never root for injuries, especially with them or like the Rams. They're missing all their wide receivers. You don't want these things. So we want everyone to stay healthy. We want to beat everyone at their best. So if you're a Seahawks fan right now, I think we should take a moment every night and just like pray to the rehab gods that hopefully these teams can get their injured players back and everything will be okay. Uh, But in all seriousness right now, you have to be ecstatic about what's going on with that defensive front, especially that front seven. I mean, you brought in a defensive minded head coach. You're kind of zigging while everyone's zagging. Everyone else is going out and getting, you know, an offensive minded guy who's either been touched by Shanahan or McVay in some way because it kind of feels like that's the trend that everyone else is going. McVay's had success. O'Connell's had success. McDaniel's had success. Shanahan, obviously success. Zach Taylor, he's had success, right? So you have all these coaches who used to be under offensive-minded guys. It seems that's the way the league's going. You zag, and all that it's done is turn your defense into one of the worst from the last year before to now one of the best. Now, obviously, you still need to clean up some of the round, the run game stuff, right? Like New England was able to run not all over you, but they did very well in that game, especially late in the second half. But it feels like when it comes to stopping the run against Denver and against Miami, you were able to get that done. Defensively, the amount of pressures that you're getting out of Mafe and Hall, I mean, it's just second to none right now. When you have two defensive ends that are able to get after the passer and you only have to rush four, instead of scheming up, you know, blitzes where you add a linebacker, you add a nickel and a linebacker, you're built, you're dreaming up, you know, zone fire concepts, you're dreaming up man fire concepts. You're just letting your D lineman get after the quarterback. Oh, and you're going to get Nuosu back here within a week or so. That's big time. You have turned a defense that, Everyone was making fun of and no one was worried about. And you turned it into the strength of your team. So I'm really happy seeing what they've done defensively. Offensively, you'd like to get K-9 back. He looked good in the one game that he played. Uh, but you want him to be healthy. Gino, I think he's looked fantastic. Right now, he's just under 75% completion. Uh, he's obviously got three interceptions, but I didn't feel like all of them were 
necessarily on him. O-line's got to play a little bit cleaner so that they're keeping him upright. The guard play's gotten better every single week, but it's still not up to what I'd really want it to be at. Hopefully you get Lucas back soon. And then at wide receiver right now, I mean, there's nothing to complain about with DK. He has two big time touchdowns. And I know that's where a majority of his yardage has come from, but he's still at 262 right now. He's got a ton of targets. He's got a ton of catches. JSN, he had a huge coming out party against uh, New England. And so it feels like teams are paying more attention to him. And then that's just going to open up things for Tyler Lockett, who, I mean, every single year now for at least the last two to three, I feel like I've come in and been like, well, he's going to take a step back. Like he's getting older. He's not as fast. He's not very tall. Like that step back has to come. And I just feel like it's never going to come. Like, that's fine. Tyler Lockett's okay being, hey, I'll be the third guy. I'll only get, you know, seven, eight targets a game but I'll make the most of those seven to eight targets and they'll be in the biggest moments. When you needed a first down against Denver, Geno Smith went to him. When you need a crucial, you know, second down, Hey, everything's breaking down. Geno's out of the pocket scrambling. Who does he go and find? He always finds Tyler Lockett. So I've been largely impressed with what this team has done, especially on defense, but offense as well. This is the Seahawks' first 4-0 start since 2020. They are one of five, just five teams in the NFL right now that remain unbeaten. They have the fourth best point differential in, in the NFL with a plus 30 run different uh, point differential. They're allowing the fourth fewest points in the NFL with 14.3 points allowed per, per game. Geno is currently third in passing yards. DK is sixth in receiving yards. The rest of the NFC, NFC West, as I mentioned, is one and two. And actually, the Seahawks are the first team since the 1979 Steelers to start 3-0 and and allow fewer than 150 passing yards in each of the first three games in a season per NFL research. You know, I know right. everyone's going to say, okay, they played the Broncos, they played the Patriots, they paid the Dolphins without Tua, but right. and this will be the first true test heading into Detroit against Jared Goff, David Montgomery and crew, Amon Ross, St. Brown, all those guys. But the Broncos ended up beating the Buccaneers in Tampa Bay, the Patriots had beaten the Bengals, who are still winless, mm -hmm. you know, the week prior before playing the Seahawks. The Dolphins, they do have the weapons on on the offensive side. Of course, right. the quarterback situation isn't isn't great there, but they have a great showing so far this year. And the they are the article that I sent you before talking about Mike McDonald and the switch beat from Pete Carroll to Mike McDonald and how just the difference in the coaching style and mm -hmm. the standard in the locker room has changed. I think this is starting to really show kind of what that difference looks like. Right. Well, you're able to see like two differing styles of where Pete's more of like, it's a competition and don't get me wrong. Pete is an intense guy, but Pete has fun with everything. Everything's about how do we do this in a fun way? Let's put a basketball hoop in our meeting room and we'll do something fun at the end of the meeting. We'll do a competition, which obviously it was successful for Pete. He coached one of, if not the greatest college football teams, or at least one of the greatest runs at USC. Like, he is a large part of why those New England teams were as good as they were. Go ask Teddy Bruschi. He created the most dominant defense in an offensive era of the NFL in the Legion of Boom. This is not a slight on Pete on what I'm about to say. But when you're not a red ass at times and times aren't people aren't necessarily scared of you. That doesn't always bode. Well, there are multiple ways to skin the cat when it comes to leadership and being an NFL head coach, but it felt like at times there wasn't enough discipline, especially the last couple of years. And now in comes Mike McDonald, who he had multiple rookies, not pass the conditioning test. Instead of saying, Hey, well, you can practice and we'll figure out a way for you to pass the conditioning test later. He said, no, you're going to go sit out on the on the football non-injured list. You're not going to be able to practice with us. I'm going to chew your ass, and then I'm going to embarrass you in front of the entire team and chew your ass again, and then chew the other guys on that team who did pass the conditioning test for not forcing you to train with them or keeping up with you when you were training to make sure you pass your conditioning test. Again, it's not a knock on Pete. But sometimes you need that new, fresh set of eyeballs in the room. And that's clearly what McDonald is. And he's a true defensive guy. Like, you can tell when you look at him. He still cares about his appearance. He's jacked. That dude is filling out his short sleeve t-shirts right now. <laughs> but he's also intense. And you can see that. 
and it comes off in his players because they have a focus to the small little details. And that's why they're winning right now. I understand, man. You get a rookie quarterback that you go up against. He's on the road in your place. He's going to struggle. But you make sure that he does, and it looks to that standard. You're playing against the Patriots. Hey, I get it. Brissett's a stopgap guy. You know it's going to be Drake May eventually. They don't have a lot of weapons over there. But it looked like they didn't have a lot of weapons. If it wasn't for Ramondre Stevens and a couple big runs, you shut them out. You dominate that game. Miami, they don't have their starting quarterback. What do you do? You go beat the second string quarterback so bad that you get to see the third guy, right? And you get after him. And you get after him play after play after play from multiple different defensive linemen. I think that's the most important part. This isn't a team where it's, hey, we have one really good defensive end, and then it completely changes. Now, I'm not saying that the Steelers' defense is a bad defense, but they're a remarkably different defense when T.J. Watt isn't in the game. When T.J. Watt gets hurt, and you've seen it the couple of seasons where he's gotten hurt, that defense has taken a step back. Now, that doesn't mean they go from a great defense to the worst defense in the league, but they go from a great defense to an average defense, and that completely changes what they are. No, I'm not wishing anyone to get hurt. But if anyone on the Seahawks team got hurt, especially on that D-line, are you saying, well, now the defense is one of the worst in the league or they're average, they're, it's done, we're cooked, it's over. No, you've got Derek Hall one game going off for a bunch of QB hurries sacks. Mafe, every single game he's got a couple. I know that Williams got hurt in that game, but in the first two, the dude looked pretty good, right? Murphy's looked well. And he's played well in his first couple of snaps through. Witherspoon, he's creating havoc. He's covering well. But it's also not like, well, Witherspoon's completely shut down one side of the field. Rick Wollins returned to his rookie year form. Again, but he hasn't shut down an entire side of the field. He shuts down a player. And so I'm saying all this because McDonald realizes the best way for this defense to be at playing at their full potential is the sum of their parts, and they all need to be playing together. And it's clear that they all are because they know that if they can find a way to earn his trust and get on the field, they're going to make a bunch of big plays. And the beauty of making a bunch of big plays for an NFL player, you get paid well. You play in this type of system and you get a bunch of QB hurries, they're going to pay you as a D lineman. You're a linebacker, you lead the league in tackles, they're going to pay you as a linebacker. You're a DB and no one catches the ball on you, they're going to pay you, whether that's Seattle or somewhere else. And McDonald has proven that if someone leaves, he'll just go find the next guy and he'll bring him in and they'll do the exact same thing because it's more about his system than it is about the players necessarily. And so right now, everything that I wanted to see out of McDonald. I've seen in this Seahawks team, you're going to get your true test this week. You're going up against the best offensive line in the NFC. You're going up against a veteran quarterback who knows how to pick teams apart. They have two really good wide receivers. I think the world of Jamison Williams, he's going to pop this year. Obviously, Amon Ross St. Brown's an all pro. Sam Laporta is a fantastic tight end. I know he got a little dinged up, so that'll be something interesting to watch. And you've got David Montgomery, who's a true old school running back. He's running in between the tackles. And then Jameer Gibbs is one of the most electric running backs out of the backfield right now because he can hit you on the edges and they find ways to get him the ball in space. So you got to be ready to stop those guys, but you get to do it in prime time. So we're truly going to find out just how good this defense is this week. And I can't wait to see it. And one excerpt from that article is Leonard Williams talking about Mike McDonald. He said, quote, he's just big on accountability, which is really important right now because it's a lot of new players and new staff, a new way of doing things around here. I think when you're trying to implement something new, it takes a lot on the players and the leaders on the team to hold everyone accountable. I think he's doing a good job. And Tariq Woolen, you know, he's the fifth highest ranked uh, cornerback in football right now per PFF. Um, Leonard Williams is the fifth highest rated interior defender currently. Right now, the, you know, we, I, I keep mentioning PFF. It's not the end all be all, but right. still the, the Seahawks are ranked first overall via PFF. Uh, the, the offense is tied for eighth. The defense is first special team is still second and they're off to a great start. And actually with a win Monday night against Detroit, McDonald will, would become the first rookie head coach since Dan Quinn in 2015 to start four and oh, and apparently it's happened uh, tens, just 10 times since 1970. And it's going to be a tough matchup. It's going to be a real test. 
the Lions' Aiden Hutchinson, he leads the NFL with six and a half sacks yeah. and 11 quarterback hits. So He's we'll see if, if this Seahawks offensive line can, can stand up against this defense. It's going to be defense against defense. Of course, the Lions have the offense also to go with it. You know, Seahawks do too. It's going to be a really good game. Yeah. Uh, the, the way that they're going to have to try and slow Hutchinson down, I don't know if it really slows him down. I mean, when you're averaging two sacks a game, I mean, shoot, he had one where he had three or four sacks, and I, I can't remember if that was Tampa Bay or if he did it uh, this last week against the Cardinals. You're going to have to chip him, and there's going to have to be a diff uh, variety of different ways that you do it. Sometimes it's going to be with the tight end that chips him on pass plays. Sometimes it's going to be the running back chipping him. Sometimes I think that they're going to set their protection the opposite way so that they can at least try and get a double with a guard over on Hutchinson. Right now, what that guy is doing, there's a reason why. Remember, when he got drafted, as soon as Trayvon Walker got picked, the pick before him, the Lions didn't even wait. It was like 9.59 time left for their draft. The Hutchinson pick was in. They were dancing. Dan Quinn, I'm pretty sure, popped a bottle of champagne when he realized that he could get Aiden Hutchinson. Like, that's how good this dude is. At the defensive end position, he can win with speed. He can win with power. What he really likes to do is get his arm into that offensive lineman because he's so long. So as an offensive tackle, usually you get a taller tackle so that they have more arm length and they can get their hands on you quick. And when you're pass proing, what a lot of O-linemen want to do is they want to keep you far away. So the whole idea of having that big 6'6", six, 6'7", six, 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 tackle is to, when you get your punch, or if you're a punch and grab guy, you're getting that full extension. You want them far away from you because if you're far away as a D-lineman, that ball's out in two to three seconds. Like, I'm good. As long as I get one or two key pops in or I can get you to just shuffle your feet and move to your counter move, I'm going to win that because you're far away. Even if you get away from me, you still got a long way to go to the, get that quarterback. Hutchinson is one of those few guys who can get just as long as those offensive linemen. And so then he's not having to stutter step to get into his counter move. He's just got arms on you. And when an old lineman is kind of doing this thing here where it looks like you're reaching, trying to catch like a bunch of apples that are falling off of a tree, when you have to do that, you're in trouble. And you see a lot of old linemen just not able to get that grab or get that punch, whichever they prefer, on Hutchinson. And that allows him to get into his rip move or get into that push pull. He's a big ice pick guy where he'll spin back inside if he knows that uh, he's got a three tech with him. So that's going to occupy the guard. So it'll be very interesting to see the battle that they do going up against Hutchinson uh, on that offensive line. If you're able to slow down Hutchinson, I really like what Seattle can do offensively, but you're going to have to do something that really no team has done in the last, definitely this year, but I th say even about halfway through last year, it's like the kid figured it out. Not that he hadn't figured it out before, but it's like, he was probably working at like a B plus level. So you're like, wow, he's pretty good. He's on the fringe of being an all pro, uh, pro bowl type guy. And now every single week that Hutchinson gets out there, it's almost like, well, shoot, like, do we have to take a look at him as a defensive player of the year? Like, do we have to talk about him in that Miles Garrett, TJ Watt kind of category? Has he reached that? And so if Seattle's able to formulate a game plan to get him slowed down and take care of him, I really like their chances. If he's eating us alive, if he's getting after Geno Smith, if he's really working that O-line, he's working Stone Forsyth, who I think he'll go up against mo most of the game, that could be a problem. The guy is 6'7", 270. You look at pictures of him, he's like 0% body fat. Uh, against Tampa Bay, he got four and a half sacks. He, he's had 16 combined tackles on the year. I mean, he's an absolute beast. He's yeah. unbelievable. He's so fat. And he, he's every... O lineman's worst nightmare because usually when you're at that tackle spot, you either have a strong guy who's got like power, right? That would be like your Calais Campbell. He's going to use his strength and speed. Like he's long, like you are, and he's all power. Well, I know how to fight power. I'm going to sit down in it. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to hop if he's going to bolt. Or you get a speed guy. That's like a Von Miller. Like Von Miller, I like, man, I get it. 
you got to get in front of him. But if you can get in front of him as an offensive lineman, there's such a size difference that you should be okay. But when you go up against that Hutchinson, you go up against a TJ Watt, um, you know, a Miles Garrett, they're as fast as Von Miller, but they're as strong as Calais Campbell. And they got the reach to reach you. And they're all smart. Their football IQs are so insane. They know what you're going to do before you do it. That's that's the worst nightmare, man. That is the Terminator being built as an offensive tackle. That's scary stuff. As far as the uh, the injuries, looking at the injury report, there's Kenneth Walker, um, Uchenna Nuosu, uh, Jerome Baker, Leonard Williams, and Byron Murphy are all currently questionable, but they are estimated to return for this game. So hopefully, you know, the Seahawks are back to full strength with K-9, with the full defense. And, you know, hopefully they'll have the best shot at taking on the Lions in, in Detroit. K-9 was his, I'm trying to find it right now. It was his, oh, oblique. So he's, he's got a core injury. If he doesn't play in this game, I don't think it's the end of the world, whether you win or lose. One, I think Charbonnet's played pretty well. Um, he's mm-hmm. really good in pass protection. Now, obviously, Walker has a little more big play, explosive play capability that you would really like to have in this. But the injury that he has, when you injure that oblique, is the same thing that Quinn Ewers is dealing with right now in college where you kind of need to be careful with it because it's something that if you don't wait and take that time to recover, you're going to deal with it the whole year. So there's a part of me right now, you start out the year 3-0, and even if you go 3-1, and shoot, even if he misses another game or two, I'd rather have Kenneth Walker at 100% about halfway through the year to the end of the year where I'm not dealing with an injury than every, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday practice report. It's like, all right, like I got to read, like, did, did K-9 practice this week? How do you re- do? How do you, you know, I felt like when Jadavian Clowney was in Seattle, they tried to rush him back too much. And so he kept dealing with that core injury. It's just one of those spots where it doesn't – it takes time to recover, and if you come back too fast, you're not giving it that time. It's like a hamstring injury or broken ribs. Like, you break your ribs. You don't put your ribs in a cast. That doesn't happen, right? Like, you just kind of have to wait until they heal. So take the extra time. It's the same thing with the core. It's the same thing with, like, a hamstring injury. Let that thing heal. If you need to take an extra week, take it. If you need to take two, take two. Right now, the Seahawks aren't in dire straits. So take that time. I'd be okay if he didn't play. Obviously, I'd love for him to be back and ready to go for this game. But I also don't think it's the end of the world. Especially with the matchup that's coming after Detroit, you got the Giants at home, which should be a a pretty winnable game. Charbonnet against the the Dolphins, he had 18 carries, 91 yards, averaging 5.1 with two touchdowns. Of course, it's the the Dolphins, but averaging 5.1, that's a solid showing. What do you think the key to the game is for the Seahawks and then the key to the game is for the for the Lions? Uh, ironically, I think it's going to be the exact same thing. It's uh, For the Seahawks, I think it's stopping the pass rush, specifically do everything you can to stop Aiden Hutchinson. Wherever he is, he's got to get at least chipped, uh, if not double teamed every single play. Find different ways to keep him out of the scheme, even making him like a read player, uh, in certain spots, not necessarily in a zone read, but more of a traditional like RPOs type deal where it's like, hey, is, if he's going to follow the running back, l- let's take the slant here or the bubble screen. If he's going uh, to go after the quarterback, then we hand it off. I would really like to put him in a position where he has to make decisions quickly and there's a counter off his decisions, which is what the RPO is all made of. If you can stop Aiden Hutchinson or at least slow him down, That's a victory. And you know what's crazy? And I can't believe I'm going to say this. I think only allowing one sack to him is slowing him down. I mean, looking at the stat sheet, that's right. (laughs) Like, dude, if if you told me Seattle, it's Tuesday morning. Seattle held Aiden Hutchinson to one sack, two QB hurries, and a TFL. I'd be like, I bet you, I bet you Seattle was in that game till the very end. I bet you that thing was close. I think the stat against the Dolphins was that Geno Smith was getting pressured at like 46% or something like that. That seems a bit high to me. Uh, but he had, th- th- look, the guard, the guards are having issues. That being said, Charles Cross has looked pretty good and Stone Forsyth to me, you know, being your second string, third string kind of tackle, he hasn't done too bad. You're going to get Peters here. 
I mean, he's not going to play this week, but you're going to get Peters here for a little bit, which does worry me because that means that uh, Lucas might not be back anytime soon. I just, that guy's got to stay healthy. He's so good when he's in. Uh, he just can't stay healthy. And then you would ask me what the key for the, the Detroit team is. It's stopping the pass rush. Now, the difference with the Seahawks pass rush is you don't have one key guy to lean on. Like, I guess you could say, hey, you got to stop Boye Mafe because he's been the most consistent pass rusher. But at the same time, like Derek Hall and him are tied. They each have three sacks on the season. Uh, Williams has a sack and a half. You've got a couple linebackers that have come in for sacks. And let's not forget, Devin Witherspoon from that nickel spot, if they want to run a nickel fire uh, or some kind of fire zone that involves that nickel, he, he'll get back there and he'll get a sack as well. So there are a lot of different variations to this, uh, but both teams need to stop the pass rush of the other if they want to win this game. I think when we look back on Tuesday morning and we're doing our Tuesday morning quarterbacking, whether it's a happy day because the Seahawks found a way to win or it's a sad day because Seattle wasn't able to pull it out, it's going to be said, hey, they couldn't stop the pass rush. That's why we lost. Hey, our pass rush hit home. That's why they won. Looking at the actual stat from NFL, it was uh, three sacks taken and 43.2% quarterback uh, pressure percentage against the Dolphins. Um, but yeah, totally agree with that. It's going to be an awesome primetime game on Monday night, 5.15 p.m. Pacific time in Detroit. The Seahawks are going all white. Detroit's going all black. Fortunately, they're not wearing all blue, so they don't blend into the wall. Like I think it was week one where that was happening. The current over under is 48 and a half points and uh, the lines are favored by three and a half right now. What do you think of those lines? Uh, 48 and a half to me. That puts both teams right at about that 24 mark. I have such a hard time with the over unders in the NFL because it's, it feels like every time I'm like, yeah, I nailed that. It turns it <laughs> like everyone's hurt for the 49ers. Everyone's hurt for the Rams. And then it's like Juwan Jennings, three touchdown day legacy performance. Like, really? Are you kidding me? Um, right. If I had to lean any way, I'm probably – like this to me is a game I'm probably going to stay away from. Uh, it's just one where, like, again, I, on Tuesday, if the Seahawks win, I'm not going to be surprised. And they, you know, obviously they would cover. But if the if the Lions won and they covered, that wouldn't surprise me either. You know, it just feels like it's going to be a back and forth game. It's going to be a true ch chess match. So you're going to find out, hey, how good is McDonald when it comes to going up against one of the top offenses and uh, a great offense of mine in Ben Johnson? And how good is Grubb going up against uh, Glenn when it comes to a top offense going up against a pretty decent defense? Um, so this is a stay away game from me and just sit back and watch and enjoy. Like if you want to throw money on a game, you're like, I have to bet a game. I'd probably bet the under in the Titans Miami game because it is a doubleheader on Monday night. So if I was going to throw any money, throw it on that crappy game, throw that one up on your laptop, get the big screen TV up with the Seahawks and Detroit, and then just sit back and enjoy the show. It's going to be a great game. It's going to be a fun game. Uh, and then hopefully Seattle's able to come out on top. And all of a sudden you're sitting at four and oh, and you have a big win against Detroit who you're now, you would be three games up essentially because they'd be two and two. You'd be four and zero, oh, so two games plus you had you'd have the tiebreaker. And then whatever happens in your division, you're at minimum two games up on whoever's in that division. If any of them lose, all of a sudden you're three games up. That's a big deal. I know it's early. I know it's week four, but this Seahawks team to me looks like a team that you got to be starting to pay attention to playoff races, not just in your own division, but in other divisions as well. When it looks at that wild card for the conference, you got to stack these games up while you can early in the season. And, uh, yep. you know, if they are able to pull it off in Detroit, they got the giants at home. Like I said, good shot at starting five and zero on the season. If they pull it off against Detroit, it'll be a great matchup against again, primetime Monday night, be on the lookout for our recap coming. It'll be Tuesday, uh, Tuesday or Wednesday coming up, We're talking about the giants preview as well as the lines recap. So, Thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Will, for joining me, and uh, we'll see you on the next one.